Okay, um, we've got a bit of a different paper um, because we're looking at historical projects um, and in particular the work of Michael Brown whose papers are held here um, at the Landscape Institute Archive. Um, so we'll look at some mid-60s projects um, on how Brown um, developed some play spaces in cities um, to create family-friendly environments. Um, Michael Brown was Edinburgh-born architect and landscape architect <coughs> whose work combined leading Scottish and American spatial theories in the mid-20th century. Brown's projects covered all scales of landscape architecture and are of special interest due to his commitment to integrating the theories and practices of both disciplines and countries. And it resulted in a body of work that was inventive and practical. Brown's work so far has been forgotten in the canon of notable landscape architects in the United Kingdom. And we'd like to use this opportunity to present two of his housing teams. Uh, one is Livingston Road um, in Battersea, and the second is Lancaster uh, West in North, Kensi North Kensington. Um, and we're going to look at the specific focus on his ideas about children's play. The particular focus of these two estates is underpinned by the imminent redevelopment in the case of the Battersea example and the possibility of a not so distant future development in the case of North Kensington as it's adjacent to the Grenfell Tower um, estate. Brown stated uh, the art and aesthetic delight of landscape must emerge out of solving down-to-work problems both elegantly and simply. And with this focus on the solution of down-to-work problems, Brown's work navigated the complex tensions of the profession that existed both then and now by advocating an objective, theoretical and interdisciplinary approach. He was born in Edinburgh in 1922, and between 1940 and 41. Uh, and 47 to 51, he enrolled to study architecture at the Edinburgh College of Art. Following this, Brown held an internship at acclaimed Scottish architect Sir Basil Spence Practice, a former ECA lecturer um, renowned for hiring promising graduates from the architecture course at Edinburgh. With Spence, Brown was catapulted to the forefront of architectural design in the UK where the firm was working on the radical reconstruction of Coventry Cathedral and the prestigious Festival of Britain. Upon graduation, Brown moved to London to work for the London County Council Architects Department at a time when innovative local authority housing developments were common practice. And as we'll shortly see, his later work uh, with London's many housing estates shows his in-depth knowledge of the criteria and best practice of housing areas, as well as the potential issues and shortcomings. Brown's architectural training at ECA, Spence and Partners and the LCC provided a solid foundation for the development of his subsequent career, a career that continually focused on the tensions of built form and open space. Brown later found the design of residential environments to be the ideal testing ground for his ideas that followed a pragmatic focus for his growing interest in the relationship between man and nature. Between 55 and 57, Brown's career shifted from architectural focus to that of landscape architecture, having received a scholarship to study under Professor Ian McHarg, renowned as the father of ecological planning at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was here, under McHarg's supervision, that Brown began to conceptually reframe the common problems associated with landscape design. Following his studies, Brown joined practices of renowned architects and landscape architects in America, such as Grant Simon, Vincent King, and most notably, Dan Kylo. Brown rejoined the Graduate School of Fine Arts as assistant professor for the academic year 59 to 60, the inaugural year of McHarg's Man and Environment flagship course. After returning to the UK, Brown started to work as an architect in small architectural practices in Oxford, and then he spent a year as a landscape architect with Eric Burke Lyons at Span Housing. And in 1962, he set up his own practice, uh, the Michael Brown Partnership. 
His understanding of housing estates and their landscapes derived from his various educational and professional experiences and his background in both architecture and landscape meant that he respected built and open spaces as one total environment and organised outdoor spaces according to these functions. Play areas, as we'll see, were part of this whole unity. So moving on to Livingston Road, it was designed in 1962 and it was developed with architecture, architects George Drew and Dunn Partnership. It saw the design of an open space system within a medium density new housing estate in central London. It was one of his earliest projects and he started to work on it the same year he founded his practice. The scheme exemplifies the start of Brown's objective approach uh, to design and his holistic understanding of the total environment. As a result of his objective design methodology, Brown was able to identify and resolve a number of site-specific issues at Livingston Road that would not have occurred to most other designers of the period. He later stated, if spaces between buildings are to be used to their best advantage, it's essential that methods of analysis and comparison be evolved which will enable the designer to analyse the functions and uses of external spaces very rigorously. And utilising this approach, Brown tested his design objectives against social, economic and environmental needs of the site and its future residents. The limitations and requirements of the site at Livingston Road resulted in the unusual decision to increase the proportion of hard space with the intricate use of planes, slopes and ramps in order to control the flow of movement. Garden spaces were restricted to courtyards, um, and they were lo located at key secluded spots to create a range of semi-private spaces enclosed on three sides by four to five storey maisonettes. The courtyards were linked together by a central spinal route called the Livingston Walk, which created a varied sequence of spaces and uses. His demand for rigorous functional approach to the external spaces was informed by his formative years in education and practice, and particularly under McHarg at Penn, but also to some extent uh, Basil Spence and Eric Lyons. Firstly, the Livingston Road courtyards worked with the ideas put forward in McHarg's courthouse concepts, and this was an article published in 1957 and used as the basis for the first studio project at Penn, taught to Brown's cohort in the same year. Just five years later, in 1962, Brown was revisiting these ideas by providing usable and useful open spaces within the residential areas of Livingston Road. Under McHarg's tutelage, Brown explored the potential that courtyard layouts uh, presented in creating defensible spaces to encourage a sense of ownership in residents. The open spaces of Livingston Road each were given a distinct character through the careful detailing of landform on sunken and raised levels to create soft spaces embellished with sculptures and wall panels. And despite the restricted use of lawns, Brown proposed an extensive tree street tree planting throughout the scheme, which resulted in green views afforded from every household. The courtyard typology served as a functional extension of the house by providing space to live out family life in the city, addressing a significant cultural issue of the period that McHarg had railed against in the migration of young families to new towns and suburbs due to the lack of appropriate services and spaces to support family life in city centres. Further to the potential that courtyard layouts provided in creating semi-private spaces for family use, McHarg had a wider impact on Brown's specific approach to play. During his employment under McHarg in 1959-60, Brown was charged with compiling a database of contemporary articles and projects from around the world on the theme of play. And this was part of a wider knowledge collection exercise for McHarg. In this work, a, the work of Danish architects Egon Muller Nielsen was particularly influential not only through international publications that were compiled by Brown, but also in the abstract play sculptures that were being implemented across Philadelphia in the 1950s. 
Brown had collated information on Muller Nielsen's playgrounds in Stockholm, and he was well acquainted with the new playscapes popping up as part of the Philadelphia Department of Recreation's efforts in association with the landscape architects Cornelia Hahn Oberlander and Muller Nielsen. In an essay on art and playground, Gabriella Burkhardt argues that Muller Nielsen's play sculpture revealed that playgrounds could take on a significant role in the city, um, fostering a different relationship between children, families and their neighbourhood. And with this reinvention of play as function of the city, Burkhalter also draws parallels to the work of Aldo van Eyck, another European architect who was redefining play on an international scale in the 1950s, and who also, importantly for our story, was heavily involved in the teaching and research of McHarg's department. This process of reviewing contemporary theoretical and practical approaches to play and being well acquainted with individuals at the forefront of the shift in play design meant that Brown had a uniquely deep understanding for a newly qualified designer of the importance of design for play and its role in the city. And this depth of knowledge is evident in the housing schemes he developed throughout his career. Almost a decade later, Brown was continuing to build on these ideas and to better integrate sculpture, play and city spaces in another London housing estate, Lancaster Road West in North Kensington. And I'll hand over to Luke, sir, for that one. Yeah, thank you. So, um, the project in Lancaster Road West, which... Uh, um, um, you can see on the slide, um, was commissioned by the Royal um, Borough of Kensington and Chelsea and was designed and built between 1969 and 1976 by Brown. Um, he designed it with um, architects Clifford um, Verdon and Associates. Um, his um, the um, full plan. So his role in the project, Brown's goal, was to um, create all the detailed landscape plans um, for both hard and soft landscape, including small public open space, children's play areas, um, and the landscape treatment of pedestrian decks to link with a comprehensive de development um, in the site. Um, the space is designed by Brown, um, they're enclosed by um, and surround three, thin uh, three linked low rise deck access blocks. Um, the blocks themselves were five storey high with a car, uh, car parking and ter um, service access situated underground. Um, and on these um, detailed drawings that are all um, here in Merle, um, <clears throat> you can see that the residence's stories were lifted, a uh, half storey above the ground, uh, which created uh, an opportunity for a very interesting treatment of the changing levels um, in the landscape. It also created enclosed courtyard type spaces in between the buildings. The elevated coastways, um, ramps, steps and areas overlooking the landscape um, were definitely mastered by Brown to create a highly interesting landscape, um, although typically for his design his material palette was um, quite limited. Um, however, the area also created an opportunity to fulfil his main ideas about playscapes. Um, you can see the, the playground um, details on this one um, um, and an amazing drawing about the walls um, that he designed. So his main idea that the whole housing, housing estate, the total environment um, should be designed as fittingly for children as for adults can be seen um, throughout this project. Pictures depicting the Lancaster Road West housing estate were published widely both in the UK and abroad, appeared in journals um, in um, various countries and in his lecture um, slides that he gave against the world. Well, you can all see um, on the slides that, uh, or on the pictures that children uh, were playing feel, uh, very freely in the area, just as Brown intended um, the places to be used. The idea of the abstract sculpture of form um, in um, these walls um, that should be uh, used freely um, by the children appeared in many of his other um, later designs. This one um, was created for the Mortar Street development in the Mortar Street Estate in London, um, also uh, had in a, 
Um, when talking about outstanding examples of playgrounds, in her book, Lady um, Ellen of Hortwood used examples from various countries that were new and imaginative, according to her. One of these was Brown's Livingstone Road project, described by Hurtwood as highly successful. As she explained, the entire landscape scheme has been conceived in terms of children's play activities and all the outside spaces and pedestrian ways have been considered as potential playscape um, and are part of the total environment. A number of different types of playgrounds have been provided, um, but children's play has not been regarded as an activity which should be restricted to these areas. This evaluation describes Brown's own ideas about children play areas. He believed that design play areas do of course have value, but are much less important than achieving the right general character of the total housing environment. Going further, he elaborated his understanding of children's place um, areas, saying that play being for children a part of living, it is pointless to design for as uh, if it were a commodity that can be procured only at designated spaces. A sort of supermarket at which their needs can be uniquely provided. The fact is that the instinct for play is within the child. Our job is to nurture the development of the instinct that is an essential part of the child's total development. The understanding of only creating an environment suitable for play rather than specific um, highly designed play areas was clear in the arrangement of both Livingston Road and Lancaster Road. Lady Hurtwood described, and these are images from Lady Hurtwood's book, First priority has been given to the creation of sitting places and enclosures that are satisfying for active or inactive play, um, to the planting of trees that help to form these spaces, and by the introduction of a variety of surfacing materials. To create places um, suitable for active or inactive play was based on Brown's deep belief that the designer has to give freedom to the user to decide how they want to use the space. As he argued, what is important, and this is true for all age groups, is that users, consumers, tenants and owners, and we are often one or more of these, are made to feel that the whole of their habitation belongs to them. Quite simply, for a design to be integrated with its users' needs, it must offer choices and possibilities. Our role is to make places that lend themselves to a multitude of uses. This understanding that treated children in the same way as the grown-ups um, put Brown into the forefront thinkers of new types of playscapes. Hertzwood argued that children and young people of all ages, like adults, need a great variety of activities. The essence of our provision for them must be to give them freedom to choose. In both the projects discussed, Brown brought together ideas of the courtyard as a layout device to provide space for family life in the city, um, the newly emerging ideas about abstract play sculptures, and he was able to create a total environment suited to the needs of young families while also addressing by the cultural process of the city at large. Brown saw his project as complex ecologies that consisted of housing and landscape built and opened together with its users. His approach, influenced by the latest theories of ecological design and environmental thought, was successfully translated to be used in the urban environment and resulted in excellent designs both spatially and in terms of technical detailing. <coughs> While we have chosen to focus on two of his early residential projects, throughout his life Brown would work tirelessly to draw together the distinct strands of academia and practice in each of his diverse projects, from urban squares to airports and infrastructure schemes. His never finished book, um, Design with Urban Nature, shows how he successfully translated the McHargian design theory to be used in the urban environment. Many of his projects have been altered or even fully changed in recent years. We hope to direct the attention to his remaining impact or slightly changed projects, many of which have attracted various awards at that time, and to their underpinning theory and methodology that was exemplary both nationally and internationally. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.